mind so bold With every move the stories unfold What's cheering on the youth From the start to the win Giving them the mic, let their voices begin Interviews and highlights, we got it all GM Sports Show, where the young stand tall GM Sports, where the youth lead the way Champions of tomorrow, making waves today From ages five and up, we help them grow It's their time to shine on the GM Sports Show Our vision is to become the premier platform for showcasing and empowering young student athletes, providing them with the tools and exposure to excel both in sports and life, while shaping the next generation of confident, media-savvy leaders. The GN Sports Show is dedicated to highlighting the talent and stories of young student athletes across all sports disciplines. We aim to equip them with vital media exposure and public speaking skills, helping them grow into confident individuals both on and off the field. Through engaging interviews, mentorship, and real world media experiences, we strive to foster personal and professional development that supports their athletic journeys. And welcome to the sixth episode of the GN Sports Show. It's great to have you guys here this week. Um, this week, my co-host Jonathan is not here, but we have Ricardo Richard Santos, president of GNFC Rebels, co-founder, um, founder, creator, pre presenter, everything of the GN Sports Show. And this week we have a, a pack lineup. This week we have the GNFC Rebels under 17 um, players and coach. We have the um, national representatives from the national swim team. We have a representative from Island Photo. And great, we have a representative and the head coach of the Trinity School in England. So guys, stay tuned. This is a packed, packed episode. And you would want to hear, you want to be here, don't miss it. See you when you get back. And welcome back, guys. As we said, we're going to kick off the show with the superstars of the under-17 from GNFC Rebels. We have Keldon Geese and we have Mr. Clayton Compton. Clayton Compton. Clayton silent in the corner there, man. So, guys, welcome to the GN Sports Show. We bring you here because we want to know. We want to know what you're all about. We want to know what your passions are and what, how, what drive you have to go towards, you know what I mean, the best that you could be while being here in GN, on, the, on GNFC Rebels. All so, right? So we can start off with you, Kelvin. What, what got you into football? Why did you start football? Anybody encouraged you into it? Well, the reason I started football was when I was younger, my, like, around five, my older sister, she played on the national team, wow. my older brother and my dad. So it just pushed me to like want to train harder and play more football and become better than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Clayton? What, what made you decide, you know what, I want to play football, man. I want to be as good, I want to do this. When I was in Sweden, I had friends before I came to Antigua. They played football in school and so and it just, I just ended up playing football and I just loved it from there like when I was about seven years old in Sweden before I moved. And wow. It just continued from there. And, and Clayton, you went to Varsity 9 yeah. over the summer and you did some training there. Tell us what your experience was like up there yes. and how, did, how does it differ to, to what we do down here? It was nice. I enjoyed it a lot. The facilities were a lot better since it was in England. Had nice turf better yeah better footballs better everything um the training was more intense i would say it was more intense in here because they have i was playing against a lot of like older people which were like 18 and all, mm. all the way to 21 so wow yeah i have i asked some other uh GNFC players who had gone abroad to England before and so I'm gonna ask you since you went over there to Varsity 9 What was the feeling? What was the feeling you had? Because yeah, you say you were in Sweden, but now you're going into this huge school You know what I mean? This huge um, institution, the fields, the, the everything. How did it feel? Was it overwhelming? The feeling you got when you got in there and you're like, wow, this is not Antigua. You, you know what I mean? Like. Was it intimidating to you? Yeah. Or did you get goosebumps and say, boy, I got to do my do now? 
I was I was a bit nervous when I got there. Saw everyone, new people. Right. Yeah, and I just wanted to perform my best. And on the field, I was nervous, messed up a lot because <laughs> nervous. Yeah. And, yeah. But you yeah, felt a bit professional, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I I visited him while he was there, and um, he didn't look nervous to me. But but he, but he pretty and yeah. he got a good report card from the varsity nine, didn't yeah. you? And Kelvin, move over to move over to you. You've you've played for Generation X for about three years, yeah. four four. Approaching four years. I'm for approaching four years, and you've played in in the leagues that, and the Gomez Netherlands Insurance Youth Football League. Yes, um, how did you find the league? Um, for the past four three years I've been here. If we, in when I was playing with the under 15, we. Did okay in the Gomez League. Um, in the my year after, we also did okay. And then previously, like last year, we came third. So I think for the time that I've been there, that's the best that we did since I was there. Um, the other teams, they were good. Everybody had good sportsmanship. Um, everybody was competitive. Everybody wanted to win. So it was to me it was a good experience and hope to do it again in January. Yeah. January. Well, we started in February. February. In February. Do you do you play for anyone else? Do you play football for anyone else like clubs or anything outside of Generation X or even for school? I play in my school. We playing in the inter school football competition right now. Mm. I'm not sure how we doing right now, but we were supposed to have a game today, but it got called off. We had our last game, we beat Irene B1-0. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't play with a team, another team outside of Generation X, but I used to train with CV Farm FC. Okay, okay. During early, early, early during the year. What school do you go to? I go to the St. Anthony second. St. Anthony second. And what form are you in? I'm in fifth form. Wow, fifth form. Clayton, yeah, what? same with me. I go to St. Anthony secondary school. I'm in fourth form. Fourth form? Yeah. Do you, and Clayton, do you have any particular subject that you favor? Mm, probably physical education. <laughs> you know, we, we don't yeah. play football, so it's nice. You we don't, we don't have any mathematics here. No, but you can't say nothing about that, you know, because right now PE is such a thing. It's yeah, you it's have, a science. You have the, the theory and you have the practical. Back in my day, PE wasn't really something that you back looked in, at. Back in our day, PE was fun. Yeah, and what about you, Kellen? Any subject particular that you like, your favor? My, my favorite subject is EDPM. Okay. EDPM right now. Well, who's your favorite teacher? In this, in, come on, there's all a chance to get some good grades, you know. Teacher is watching. My favorite, Mr. Nathan. Mr. Mr. Nathan, 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 IT. And, yeah. and how would you? How would you? How, EDP, EDPM. EDPM? I would say Miss Ben. She teaches art. Art, yeah, art is Ben. So you artistic? You're artist? No, I, I dropped art. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a nice teacher, so I like it. Oh, so you like? She's it? nice to me. Okay, okay. And and that you works. and you boys are you boys are doing. Let me ask you first, um, Kelvin. You, you're doing your CXCs this year, am I correct? Next year. Next year? Yep. You're not doing any this year? No. How about you, Clayton? Yeah, I think I'm doing them next year in fifth form. Oh, no. Because I know sometimes you do it in early. Yeah, in early. Yeah, a couple of subjects. I have friends that do it early. And, so. and, and how do you balance your schoolwork with your football, Kelvin? Um, the schoolwork and the football is, is kind of hard. But when I started, like in September, everything was con like bungled, bungled up and confusing. So I had to, a couple weeks after, I had to get everything sorted because I was starting to not handle assignments on time. Mm. So I had to get that schedule fixed and now I'm on top of stuff. That's good. And how about you, Clayton? For me, when I first started, it was difficult. Like Kevin said, I had missing assignments, but now I don't tend to see it as difficult as it was. So. If it, school work is coming in. Just one piece of advice because you, you have another couple of years before you go off to mm -hmm. university. Start balancing your school work with your with your football. You have to, you have to start it from now so that when you get into the university, mm -hmm. because once you get into the university, the coaches are not concerned about your home your homework and your mm -hmm. assignments. And your professors are not concerned about your training and the matches. So if you get that balance done now, 
And then when you get into the university stage, it'll be that much easier. Yeah. And then, well, we've, we've heard from international coaches and stuff like that at schools abroad in the UK, mm -hmm. and they would tell you, your academics is just as important as, your, as the football. And you have to keep them in balance because then you wouldn't get to go play football if the academics is not running in par. But what do you guys want to do? Let me go with you, Kalen, first. What do you want to do? You're in, you're in fifth form. Your, your, have, your options now is A-levels, university, and stuff like that. What do you want to do for, the, for your future? What, do you, what career path do you think you want to pursue in your future? In the future, if the football doesn't go my way, I want to do more business, so my plan was to create, like, build a, a motor dealership mm. and sell like any vehicle with like with um a motor. Okay, what about you? Yeah, same with me. If the football doesn't work work out, um, my dad has a business that I would take over. So yeah. But you guys say if the football doesn't work out, mm. let's just play the devil's advocate. If the football works out, what would it be? I'd be professional. <laughs> <laughs> Playing for, for what? Uh, a UK team? Uh, Manchester United. Manchester United. Where were you played in? Um, I'll probably go to England too. Uh, Arsenal. Arsenal. <laughs> oh my. Oh my. <laughs> and, you, and do you have a favourite player? My favourite player? Currently or? Yeah, currently. Or uh, favourite player of all time? Cristiano Ronaldo. Hey, he's a smart fella, you know. Hey, we have two smart fellas here on the table. And, uh, and I'll tell you something. I don't need to ask if the favorite team. Your favorite team is? Manchester United. And yours is? Arsenal. So we don't need to ask them that because they already basically said what team they wanted hey, to play for. I don't care. I just know Ronaldo is the guy. Mm. <laughs> We've had other players and they give you all kind of different names. But the GOAT is the GOAT. Let me deal with it straight up. To me, the all-time goat is Pele. Pele. Okay. Pele to me is the all-time Hats off. Hats off to the yeah. Pele. Anyway, but we'd like to thank you boys for coming on the show. Yep, it's been insightful. It's been enlightful. You know what I mean? Thanks. I want you guys to, you know, focus. You guys are in fourth form and fifth form. Mm. This is the time when you all have to really, as, as Ricky said, balance your, your pursuit. Right? You have to get that academic into, the, into your sport. And just know, if you get the academics at that level, your sport might be easier because then you're looking at scholarships and you know, all these different things. So, because you know as well, you guys have been part and, and around our combines that we've yes. had. And you know coaches and, and agents that come here, they want you because you're good, but they also want you to be able to fit into school. Well, they have to have the academics. To you get have to get, yeah, yeah. You can be offered the scholarships, but you have to have the academics. Anyway, we'd like to thank you, boys. Thank for you guys so much. And you know what I mean? We'll, we'll, we'll see you guys yeah. soon, and we'll always keep track of all the things you're doing. And we, we will be back. And we're back to the GN Sports Show, and right now we have some superstars in the building. We have Wayne Mitchell, who is the head coach and national coach for the Antigua and Barbuda swim team, and two of his finest, finest, Miss Madison McMillan and Ellie Shaw. Welcome, guys, to the GN Sports Show. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Madison, talk to me. Tell me about your whole experience here with the national um, swim team. Um, what are the training challenges you, you have faced while being a part of the national swim team? Um, it's not really challenges. It's more like what like we go through mm -hmm. here because we, we don't have the amount of resources that others mm -hmm. do. So it's more that like, you know, like this pool is right. like the one thing we have. So it's like, it's more what we have it's nothing like you know swimming is really f for me right. it's fun because you know the atmosphere i like how like competition and everything is it's all fun for me so and and, and ellie you have some impressive achievements that you've made particularly in 2024 in the oecs swimming championships and in Carifto. Uh what do these accomplishments mean to you and how do they reflect on your growth well they mean a lot to me because i take it as a symbol of my hard work I've put in a lot of work to get these results and they help me grow. They keep me motivated. First of all, like I like the atmosphere, like Madison said, making new friends, traveling, going around the world. So it just keeps me motivated. Like I want to go places. So <laughs> I really push it. Well, you're really, you're really doing well. You both have the opportunity to represent 
Antigua and Barbuda, right, on a national stage. What does it mean to you to represent your country, to represent Antigua and Barbuda? Like, what does it mean to you? And you know what I mean? How do you handle the pressure of competing on a global stage, an international stage? So it's like, I feel really honored and proud of myself because when I was a little girl, I saw all these, like all the old people and so <laughs> doing this and I was like, whoa, I don't think I'm going to get there. But now I'm here, and I'm right. like, wow, you know, it's a, like an honor, you know, because it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. And like, when you represent your country on a bigger level, you kind of feel like more nervous because you don't want to let down anybody. It's like, um, as if like you feel like everybody's watching you, counting on you, you know, and you just want to do your best. So really it's like you just try and put your all in that one race and then continue 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 to put your all in everything so yeah is there any sort of intimidation anything there it's like when I, for example when i went to mexico there were girls that were like three times my size like they were wow. much bigger than me because like i look real i mean i'm t i like to say i'm tall for my right. age so when i go next to them i'm like whoa i look small <laughs> So it's like it's like a little bit of intimidation, but like I try not to let that get in my head because right. then it will psych me out. And then, but like when I then beat them, I just feel like uh, oh, you know. Uh, gotcha. And and um, Ellie, you set a, a few new records in 2024, yeah. and particularly at the OECS Championships. Did you did you feel you were going to break them before? And could you give us a walkthrough as to as to how you think it, you were going to do? Okay, originally I did not think I was going to get any PBs, like I didn't think that I was going to because we had a trial meet before and I didn't, I don't think I had any PBs and I really put my all into that trial meet. So I just went into this meet, I just wanted to give it my all so my country could win and we did win, but no I did not think that I was going to get a national record or any PBs. Mm. but. I just tried and I surprised myself. That's good. So yeah. And that's very good. So looking back at your achievements and, and your swimming career, what achievement you think you're most proud of and what particularly made you proud of that, that achievement? And what what is the turning point for you? Okay, I would like to okay. In twenty twenty two, um I was like a very close to quitting swimming wow. very very close to quitting swimming and I went to an OECS and I was like this is gonna be my last meet like I'm done after this mm -hmm. um, but then I went that one last time and like like I was with new people like we had like team members that I never really talked to and stuff so right. new, new people you know I just was out my comfort zone there and I was like okay I, I want to I kind of want to do this again so <laughs> yeah. I trained trained found coach Wayne then we from that like we went my first career that I think that was like my realization that was my turning point because I didn't expect to medal like I wasn't ranked high in right. much events and I medaled and I was wow. like okay wow. I can go further with this so yeah nice. and, and Ellie uh, qualifying for the 2024 Paris Olympics on such a grand scale representing Antigua. How, how did you feel? Um, I felt good, also nervous, like Maddie stated before, when you're selected to represent your country, um, and it was a small team, two people, all eyes are on you, mm -hmm. and it's like a lot of pressure that you have to, have to improve. Huh. But um, I was very proud of myself to um, be chosen out of all of these other swimmers. Um, and so that's a hell of an accomplishment. Many athletes dream of playing, of swimming or competing in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And for you to, that's a hell of an accomplishment. So congratulations yeah. on that. Thank you. Yeah. So Madison, so you have to like something else. You have to, there's Madison, there has to be something different about Madison other than swimming. When you're not swimming, what you're doing, what you like to do, what you want to do. Madison's a very um, adventurous person. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've been part of, I, well, I go to Allen Academy. Mm -hmm. I've been part of their volleyball team for two years and we okay. won both years. And I, I quite like the sport, like it's pretty fun. Like I find, I find it fun. A lot of people don't, but I do. I also fish, because oh. I mean, that's just my family's thing and I've grown into it. I love fishing, <laughs> I love it. So we're looking forward to the national fishing team and the national <laughs> volleyball team after when the season, when the swimming season is over, right? <laughs> and, and how would you, Ellie? Any, any different passions other than swimming? Yes, it's not like sports, it's just things I do at home. I like to bake. I used to draw, but 
now I don't really have much time to since my schedule is packed with yeah. finding colleges and studying and all of this fifth form stuff. So. Well, that was the next question I was going to ask you. How do you balance your academics? Because I know swimming is, is uh, it's very time consuming. You're there at the pool, if I'm correct, Wayne. We're there at yeah. the pool very early in the morning. Yes. And then you, have to go, then you have to go back and get ready for school. And then I think you're there in the afternoons again. Yeah. And then you have to go home and do your homework. Yes. So in how gym. do you find, it, you know, yeah. do you find the gym. challenges of balancing all of those things? Sometimes it's hard when I want to do other things, but I've learned to just keep it simple so I don't overwhelm myself, make myself tired. So I just stick to focusing on swimming in school and then if I have any free time, I would use it. But nothing You'd really. use it to bake? Yes, yeah. <laughs> of course. Madison on the 32nd OECS Swimming Championships in 2024. Second place in the 400, milli 400 meter freestyle. You want to tell the time? 4.3. A, the second in the 100 meter backstroke, the 200 meter individual medley, the 200 medley relay, and third place in the 100 meter breaststroke. Now, this is just on the 30 second OECS swimming. So, you also had placed a lot in the ABSF ninth in the Invitational Swimming Championship in South Carolina and the Carifta Swimming Championships. These girls are making waves, literally. Do so you have any, any milestones set for, for the future? Um, yes, um, I would like to represent Antigua and Barbuda again in the 2028 Olympics, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Hopefully make it to at least finals or possibly medal. Well, I think, well, I I think, think we did dedication. Yeah. I think we did both of them, the dedication. I think medals uh, at the Olympics is in the cards. Yeah. Congratulations to you both. And I wish you guys so much more success. Well, 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 congratulations to both of you, but now we're going to direct some questions. To the, to the big boss. To, yeah. the, to the coach over there, Wayne. Um, you know, highlighting your extensive coaching career will, be, will take us equally as a long time. So we'll just go into the questions we want you to answer. You've been coaching now for what, some 14 years? Yeah, and 15, had, 15 years. Yeah. And you've had incredible, 15 years, sorry. Mm. And you've had some incredible success, uh, not only with your club, Viper Swim Club, but also at the national level. Um, what do you believe is the key to that sustained success? Oh, it's absolutely the kids. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you can't do it without them. And uh, I've just been fortunate enough to, you know, have these uh, kids come through the system and come into swimming and choose swimming as a sport and uh, just recognize, you know, their, their strengths and uh, try and, you know, keep away their weaknesses as much as possible, don't bring that stuff up. So it's just motivating them, uh, you know, making sure that they stay in the game, making sure that they understand what it is that they got themselves into. Uh, and I try and paint a picture for them so they, they have long terms. I, I always work on long term goals with them. I always tell them to trust the process, you know, I, and I, I, I get them involved in that to make sure that they understand that this is not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's, it's a process and you have to believe in it. Um, and I constantly tell them that, though, you know, all the time. There is, there is some kind of uh, stuff to the madness that you're doing here, you know, there, there, there is some kind of like uh, light at the end of the tunnel that's, that's going to happen and it's going to come through. Uh, just as long as you follow the program that I'm designing for you guys and you make sure that you, you know, obviously work on your technique and stuff like that and focus on their weaknesses, you know. Uh, when they're young, you, you want them to, you know, keep into all the four strokes. Uh, and I think that's been one of the reasons why we've done so well in the OECS because uh, I keep on mentioning this all the time, is the level of depth that we've created uh, with these swimmers that they've created for themselves. It's fantastic, you know, they, they, they it's, it's a challenge when you, you know, something you're not good at in terms of a, a different stroke and to focus on that and to, you know, try and improve that weakness, it's, uh, you know, it's a challenge. And it just shows uh, the type of kids that we have in terms of, you know, uh, perseverance that they, they bring to the table to make sure that they are working on things to improve all the time. So. Whenever you improve on your weaknesses, it makes you much, 
better across the board, you know, with everything. So I, I really owe it to all the kids. We're very lucky to have uh, a group of kids that we currently have right now in, in all the clubs, you know. Uh, obviously, we, we share one pool, so I get to see them all swim and how they, you know, how they take on their swimming and how they, you know, respect what they do. So it's fantastic to see that. Well, under your expert tutelage and guidance, you know what I mean? You've guided Antigua and Barbuda swim team to the Carifta Championships for four consecutive years, for four years. Yeah. You know what I mean? What you would say is the main factor in the consistency with their performance, with that performance, and how do you manage to keep them motivated year after year, you know, to bring themselves back to that point? Yeah, I keep it motivated. I'll jump to the end part of that question. Keep it motivated is a challenge for any coach, uh, and it's a skill that we all, as coaches, have got to continuously improve on. I, mm. uh, you know, they look at everything you say. They, <laughs> they they pick up words and they look at everything you say. So you've got to be very very careful with choice of words. Uh, so you have to make sure that you you're not fooling them. Right. Okay, they, they know when you're fooling them. They're smart kids. These kids are doing very well at school as well. <laughs> you know, so you, you, have to, uh, you have to say the right things. And kids are different. Uh, every kid is different, and you have to acknowledge that. Yeah. You yeah. can't, one system is not going to work for one child. Okay, mm -hmm. and these are all qualities that you've got to look in them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you have to make sure you find out different qualities for different kids and you feed on that. Yeah. Uh, you have to, you know, you can be hard on one kid, cannot be hard on the other one. Okay, there's not one system that works for all. So keeping them motivated is a challenging thing. I always look at my kids to make sure that, you know, I understand them, I understand what makes them tick. And like I said, what makes this one tick doesn't make that one tick. Yeah, yeah. So that's a continuation that I do and that I deal with all the time. And I talk to them all the time. They tell me things and I start, you know, picking yeah. up what makes them click. <laughs> yeah. So I make sure that I do that. Uh, and, you know, the, the challenging part, of course, is that, you know, you have to understand they're not going to give you 100% mm -hmm. all the time. And, you know, over the years, of course, you see it. They come off a very successful meet. Uh, they've been tapered down for that successful meet. We've all done really well. And then we come back to get back in the pool. <laughs> you know, you have to be very careful how you start the, the next cycle. Mm. You know, that's very important as well. Uh, swimming is a little different, well, a lot different to other sports. Uh, yes, we go as a team, but when you're in the pool, it's very individual. Right. Okay? You cannot... So you can't, you can't, how can I make it sound that, you know, as a team in football, you can pass the ball if you're right, a little tired yeah. and that's it. But you can't go say, oh, swim that lap for me yeah. and I'll get, you know, let me just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do it. you've got to do everything that's in the program. So that's, that's also a challenging thing as swimmers, you know, so you have to identify that too. And you can't be too tough on them, especially when they've come off a really good meet. You know, you have to, you have to be... You know, I, I know coaches, you want the best, so you really be tough and right. you keep going, and, you know. But at the same time, it's okay to give like a week of, you know, a, a written program that's going to make them recover as well mm -hmm. and make them feel good. Sometimes you want them feeling fast after a meet. So instead of, you know, you put a little bit of speed and they still got that speed because it's tapered. So you hit that in there as well. They feel good in the water, that kind of stuff. So you, you get them off to, you know, a good start where they hit the ground running and they're able to give you what you want in the practice. And then the second week, it, that right. start to die off, the feel of the meat and everything else. They're getting back into it. Then you start hitting them. You start hitting them, yeah. you start hitting them with some distance, some aerobic and stuff <laughs> like that, you know? Thank you. And, and being, being the national a national coach and the head coach for Vipers Swim Club. Um, of course, you're juggling two responsibilities there. Yeah. Um, how do you see them complement one another? Um, it's a little different in our fraternity. It's, it's a little different because even though I am national coach, I, I'm representing the kids, but I'm representing kids from other clubs too. Um, but I'm not really coaching the other kids, you know, getting them ready for it. We have some great coaches that are doing that as well, you know. So um, when I represent 
and Tiger as a, as a national coach, my main emphasis is to get that stigma out of club, okay? And I'm trying to unite these kids as one team, and that's Antigua, Barbuda, Swim. And that's my main emphasis, okay? So when I give the talks on that, I always make sure that I use team and teammates and et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, these kids compete against each other as clubs throughout the year to try and make the national team. Right. You understand? So they have a friend, friendly rivalry going on, okay? But once that's over and you've made the team, that's it. We've got to emphasize the fact that you guys now, we're one team. This is it. Yeah. And that's the majority of my foundation that I try to create with the national team when I'm head coach. Uh, and it worked really well in the OECS. Uh, you know, before going, we were all a little bit scared. Uh, because on paper it didn't look fantastic, you know, we, we get a site sheet come out, it shows the competitors of the other islands, shows how they look on the position. If we go off that right now, they're looking very good. Right. But we destroyed that in terms of when the races actually began, yeah, yeah. we destroyed that. Ellie just said that she had trials. Uh, she's been there many times, but she's forgetting that at trials we weren't tapered. So she wasn't tapered in trials. Uh, and, you know, she thought she would have done a little bit better, but she has to understand that she was not tapered, she was tired still. She had a three-week taper going in, so she got fast. Mm. Uh, other teammates did really well, like uh, Madison did well in the trials. She uh, broke records in the trials. But having said that, Madison did a block of work, and, but she never raced with that block. She never went out and raced. Mm. So she improved, yes. And then in the three, she raced tired too. And then in the three weeks in taper, she absolutely blew the, wow. the blew it away again. That 400 that you mentioned is a uh, national record. Wow. Uh, Ellie put down national records. We have a lot of kids that put down national records after not having a great meet to qualify, mm. you know, because they went tapered. But there's other implications to that, why the kids weren't, uh, you know, normally we do do a little, little bit, bit of a taper. We taper the ones that are trying to make the team. Right. The ones that are going to make the team, we don't do that. We keep them going and then taper them for the meet. Okay, it doesn't make sense to taper them twice when they're going to make the team. Yeah. yeah. You know, so we had implications where we, we weren't able to be in the pool, so we didn't have much, you know, work to do a block of work that we can taper these kids down. So nobody got taper. Like the ones that are very touch and go, whether or not they're gonna make it, they didn't get taper. Because we didn't have much time to do that. So we got in the pool late. don't know what taper means. What, what do you like? Okay, so basically, it's the favorite part for the kids. It's uh, where the volume is reduced heavily. They're all nodding, they're <laughs> nodding their heads. They, their volume is reduced heavily. They get uh, a lot more rest at the wall. Mm. Uh, and their the muscles recover, so the ATP in their muscles starts building up, it's not being depleted anymore, the glycogen in their muscles, it starts building up, that's not being depleted anymore. Their heart rates are different in terms of, I'm not keeping them in heart rates at uh, you know aerobic state where right. it takes out a lot of glycogen, a lot of ATP. Yeah. Okay, so they love that because they start feeling good. And then, you know, I'm waiting for them to tell me, you know, and it starts coming. Right. Uh, like two weeks into the table, coach, I feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I feel good today, coach, you know. Uh, and again, everybody's different. You get yeah. some kids that need a longer tape, but yeah. it happens until three weeks into the tape where they say, and the other one's like looking at this guy, how does he feel good? I don't feel good. Yeah. I don't feel good, coach, you know. I said, trust the system, it's going to come. <laughs> don't worry, you're going to feel good. So yeah, kids are different. Some kids take longer to, to feel the effects. Some people straight away feel the effects. You generally find the younger ones, you know, I mean, you go to any schoolyard and you look in the schoolyard and you just see these kids just running up and yeah, down, yeah, just yeah. going all over the place, you know? They're full of energy. They have a huge aerobic capacity and that's what's being used. The anaerobic as aspect, they don't have that yet. So coaching, Age groupers, you have to take that on a different level. Mm. I can't coach age groupers in an anabolic state. I can't do that to their bodies because they simply don't have the muscle 
so it doesn't make sense. What they do have, they load it with aerobic. So I kill the little ones with aerobic. Because they can do that all day long, you know? A lot of energy. So the older ones now, so the younger ones are the ones that are telling me in the taper they're feeling good and they're ready to go, you know? So they, they recover quickly. The older ones that have more muscle mass, they need a longer taper. You've also been congratulated. You've also been, you know what I mean, um, put in the light. You know, you, you were the national coach of the year in 2022, yeah. which is, which is yeah. a big deal. Yeah, that really <laughs> was. I, I, I felt that one. Yeah. I, I, really, I really felt that one. And, did, you, uh, did you expect that it was coming or? I know, uh, I know you knew you were not. I knew I had a chance. Yes. Uh, that year, I really did because the kids put down some spectacular results in that year. Spectacular. I mean, really, really good. Uh, not just on a national level for Antigua, but also on a club level as well. Uh, we were just knocking off national records and age group records like crazy. And we were going away to, uh, to race and they were picking up medals at Carifta. Uh, at CC Can, um, we went as a club and they were picking up. Uh, at Madison actually in Trinidad got the record at wow. one of the meets at the swim meet, and it was there for quite a while. So, you know, it was it was. I knew it was a powerful year for us as a club, and it was it was a really nice feeling to get that. It really was, uh, just because. You know, I dedicated it to the kids. It, it was for them, and it showed that they, you know, had the dedication and the will to work so hard and put their trust in me. Yeah, well, we, you know. we, we, first of all, we have to commend the Swimming Association and, and you in particular. Uh, I think you've taken swimming to a very next level. It's one of the best, best um, sporting organizations, I think, that, uh, that yes. we have here in Antigua. Yes. So I have to commend you and these two lovely young ladies for your accomplishments, which is so far and wide, and so many. And thank you very much for coming on the GN Sports Show. You're most welcome, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you guys for being here. We will be back. Welcome back to the GN Sports Show. And in studio we have with us Alan Flack of Island Photo. The Island Photo is a silver sponsor of the Generation X Football Club. And we'd like to thank Alan for coming on board to tell us a little bit about Island Photo and also one of the reasons why he, is, um, why he became a sponsor for the club. Welcome, Alan. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Alan, you know, we, we're here on the GN Sports Show and we have told all of our sponsors we could not do it without you guys. You guys helped take us from one, one point to a future point and I hope you guys stay with us and help us to grow as best as we can so that we can help you grow as best as we can. So I just wanted to ask you and let the people know what kind of what services and products does Island Photo offer? And what do you think is one of your main products right now? Well, our... Or services? Our main product right now is framing mm. and also sale of picture frames, printing, custom framing is our big thing right now. Okay, okay. Can, can you give us a brief history of Island Photo and how it, how it came into operation? I know you, you're, the, you're the founder of it. Yes, Island Photo has been in operation since, as is since 1992. We really started more in, in 1985 as mm. a, just a photo studio and then evolved into the processing and printing and the retail of frames, albums. Okay. It's a technology that's evolved a lot over the years from the days of film to now where we're totally digital. Yeah, yeah. So what, what sets Island Photo apart from other, you know, photo companies and, and businesses? And how do you um, ensure a unique experience? Well, at Island Photo, what we've always done was use the best possible products for our clients' images. Mm. We've always used the best paper, the best film, which is Fuji, of course. <laughs> and that's really been our model. Not trying to corner the market and have everybody's business, but have the best products for people who want quality. Yeah. Yeah. What, what inspired you to, to become a silver sponsor for the Generation X football clubs? 
Well, as you know, Mr. Ricky Santos could sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> but he really didn't take much work. We try to be as much as possible, give back to the community that we serve in. And definitely with the youth, sports, that's definitely a plus for any society. Children getting involved in sports early in life mm -hmm. offers a lot of opportunities, not only in c future careers, but just in keeping them out of trouble, letting them learn how to interact with others in a disciplined environment. So, so seeing that you, you said that about community, I know that Island Photo has a strong presence in the community. What, um, tell me something about your community involvement and tell me what, what makes you want to get involved in the community. We all live in the one society and if as corporate citizens you don't get involved in the wider community, in building that community, there's no space for you in business. In business you have to give back to the society and more so to the people who support you da daily. Yeah. So who, what events, that, how do you choose which events to support? We don't support a lot of different events, but anything that involves youth and kids, I'm always open to. Yeah. In the world of phot photography, you basically answered it. Technology plays a major part in it. And um, what vision you have for adapting to it, not only now, but in the future? Well, when we first opened, we were state-of-the-art. And that was with film and developing film and printing pictures using chemicals. As time went by, the technology changed to digital. And I don't know if it was we were lucky or my just persistence in waiting <laughs> until the right time to, to step in to the digital technology. So when we went digital, we were once again state of the art. And in Antigua, because we can't change our machines every two years like you do in the States, when you buy a machine, it's a few hundred thousand dollars and wow. it's got to last you a while. <laughs> right. So the right decisions at the right time has really been the, the success of our business. So what, um, since we are a sports institution, what role does sports photography play in, in, in your company? And is there any specific thing tailored for sport groups like Generation X? We have quite a few photographers who shoot sports and process and print their images at our store. There are only a few who really specialize in sports. Mm. Sports is my first love. I go to every cricket match and, and photograph it, whether I have an assignment yeah. or not, <laughs> because I just love cricket. Yeah. I, mean, I love cricket. Football is a little more difficult for me in terms of timing and stuff like that. But I have quite a few guys who photograph football on a regular basis and get their stuff printed by us. It's not a very financial rewarding mm. business to get into in Antigua, right. but right. there is market for it. And we do have a few people who do it. Mm. Yeah, well, Alan, we'd, we'd like to thank you for coming on the show, first of all. And on behalf of Generation Next, we'd like to thank you for your sponsorship of the club. Um, you've been there with us, I think it was, what, seven years now? At least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and you've stayed steadfast with us through COVID, I might yes. say. You've never faltered. And, and we're very proud of the fact that they have you branded on our, on our jerseys, as you probably saw with the, on those kids a while ago. And once again, thanks for appearing on this show. And we hope we could continue to make Island Photo proud for being our sponsor. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you sponsor and you're, you're hoping that they really do you justice. So we hope that we continue to do Island Photo justice as one of our silver sponsors from now and going forward. Thank you very much. And you can look forward to my continued sponsorship. Hey, that's what we're about. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks so much, Island. Okay, it was a pleasure. Thanks, guys.
So we'll be back soon. Welcome back. And on Wix, we have um, Ryan Dixon from Trinity School in the UK. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, our, our GN Sports Show. Uh, and we just have a few questions we'd like you to answer for us. W what is your vision for the football program at Trinity School? And how do you ensure student athletes receive the best development opportunities? Oh, I think they come hand in hand. Uh, so our vision for the school is about individual development and creating footballs, footballers and pathways to the individual. So um, rather than your normal educational school football program, uh, we're about individual development and professional pathways, uh, best facilities and coaching staff, um, which takes around um, similar to what you would get or free academy to hit stern but yeah so yeah that's what why we i guess we're a little bit extraordinary to, to your normal independent school football program um we offer a little bit more um than what you would usually get in terms of players pathways um and the coaching staff so all our coaching staff are ex-professional football players um, who have a licensed coaches and obviously got good experience in the game and with that um, we can provide real authentic pathways um, whether that's in the game in the UK um, or elsewhere um, in the world with um, our contacts or obviously they want to use football as a vehicle to further their education in the States or University in England um, so it's best really to just maximize the player's potential and what pathway looks best for that individual Okay, Ryan, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how do you help to identify and nurture young talent in the school, right? And what does the role, um, what, what does the role does for your coaching philosophy and play in, uh, what does it play in their growth once you identify this, these skills? Okay, so I think each individual when they come to us, depending on their background, their um, country that they've that they've joined the school from. Um, everyone has different strengths, okay, due to their environment that they've grown up in. Um, so whether it's I don't know that they're, they're very athletic, but um, let's say technically might need a lot of detail. Um, and then we have different players. So let's say it might be someone from Spain who's completely the opposite. Technical detail is very very good, but they might not have the work rate and athleticism and competitive nature that, than some other country. So. Um, I think that's where the individual development based it and our expertise um, comes hand in hand and helps each individual because, like I said, each individual is a lot different because it's not, let's say, similar to if it's just a group or from England of, of players. We kind of know their background, what they're going to be good at, what, how they've grown up, how they've learned. Um, so it, it's very different. So it's knowing that, um, knowing their strengths, knowing ultimately that these players super strengths that they come um, that's what their identity that's what they're going to be known for so for instance if they're you know obviously really fast good at dribbling or football that's what ultimately they're going to get spotted for and that's going to be their um, super strength so you know if, there's no point focusing too much at times on weaknesses it's about how can we make your strengths super how can we get an identity for that individual player where they're going to get noticed and ultimately grow and get into a professional football club um, through their strengths and that's how they're going to get noticed and the other sides of their game through repetition and our, our um, football philosophy, our programme that we offer um, will slowly grow over time. Um, that's just football development. If they're getting the right coaching, their all-round game will develop. Um, slowly, but ultimately it's more important that they've got an identity for themselves and they know what type of player they are and that their super strengths, um, you know, are, are certainly play a big part of that. You know, I know you spoke about your, the pathways for the, for the professional side of the football. Uh, could you elaborate on um, the partnerships or the collaborations you have, Trinity School has with professional clubs or academies and how, and how that will benefit the the student footballers okay so we're situated a part of the country which um has produces a lot of talent it's a nurturing part of the country it's um the part which when i retired 
I wanted to come back to raise my kids. Um, and I think we're fortunate that the school's positioned perfectly. Probably one of the most beautiful parts of the UK. Um, I'm right next to as Exeter and Plymouth, which are um, they produce a lot of talent at this moment in time. Um, Ollie Watkins come through Exeter. Um, and Plymouth Argyle have three or four international players, young players that are coming through their, their academy and into their first team at the moment under Wayne Rooney. So um, with that, obviously a school like ourselves bring in talent to the area which wouldn't usually get noticed or they, these clubs wouldn't usually get access to it is huge. So we've got a really good rela relationship with both football clubs because we're bringing in different quality, different talent, which they wouldn't usually get exposed to um, and wouldn't get access to. So our relationship with the clubs are, um, they're probably more keen than what we are because of what we're bringing to the area. Um, and then we have Torquay United, which is a professional football club that plays in a semi-professional league locally. So their academy um, for our international students is a, also a very, very realistic pathway. Um, which is 20 minutes away from where quite a lot of our, our um, younger players play. Um, so at the moment, I think we've got one that's on trial at Plymouth Argyle, another one actually that's going after today's game because we've played the, them, um, has been invited to go in. Um, we've got six in Atlanta and we've got seven in a Torquay. So it just goes to show um, the pathway and what we offer and the connection relationship we have with our three local sides. Um, and then further afield um, related with our cover. So for instance, mine and next teammates are the likes of Brentford, Southampton, um, obviously I've got good relationships with. Um, and then for our non-British passport holders, um, we, we have good connection abroad as well in, in different countries, mainly France and Canada at this moment. Um, just to provide, you know, alternative pathways um, and options. Ryan, um, you know, you talked about a lot of the, the these talented kids and a lot of them coming from different places and so forth. What kind of support system do you have in place to help these students transition from school football to the professional arenas in terms of like the trials and scouts and stuff like that? What support system you guys have in place for that? I think that's the hardest part. Um, that transition, that jump from maybe, uh, I would say there's a jump from their environments w w which I've noticed, so their countries that, where they've grown up playing football to then come into where they're playing here at Trinity. Um, it's more intense, it's more fast, it's more physical, you got to think quicker. And that jump it takes them a little bit of a time to get used to. And then that next jump from, you know, the, the level of football we're offering to a professional level is obviously then another big jump. Um, so we just try to create a culture within the school. Um, and what's the nicest way of putting it? Probably don't sell them a fake dream, okay? We need to make them realize that it's hard work, football. It, it's a hard industry. A lot of kids wanting the same dream. Um, and at the high level, it's certainly very competitive and the work you need to be put in. And what I've realized is the boys, they've just not been exposed to it. So the boys who come here, they're really eager and that they're willing learners, um, but it's exposing them to those higher intensity, the adversity, and making them kind of understand that you have to go through hardship um, and make mistakes to grow and develop. And you need to push yourself and put yourself in situations that are tough and not sit in comfort zone. Um, so it's about us creating that environment here to make sure that they're ready when they do get that opportunity. Um, and I think they get that probably more so with the experience of the coaches and ex-pros we have here because um, we can provide them with you know, what it takes and um, yeah, what's really needed. And sometimes it's easy for us to say that, but sometimes they also have to think it. So that's where our showcase games and main academies where they experience that and feel the intensity. Um, and exposing them to it as much as they possibly can to help them grow and play at that level as much as they can. So, um, yeah, yeah, I bridge that gap pretty well. What are some of the biggest challenges that, um, that you face in creating a successful football program while ensuring that the student athletes have a well-rounded education? What are some of the challenges that you face there? I think that's like it. it's um, hard to find that balance, um, but I think we're fortunate, probably more fortunate than most schools, that 
um, we have a good network and good connection with our school. So ultimately, it's not a football programme and a school run separately where you're clashing. Um, the timetable within the footballs run within the school schedule. Um, so for instance, Monday you've got maths in the morning and then after that you've got a football session. So it's counted as a football lesson, so it's integrated within um, the school timetable. Um, I think it works well because our headmasters run good football programmes before um, and they're really buying in they know the value that the football programme and, and the students, um, what, what it takes um, to make it successful. So everyone kind of hand in hand and works together um, and they understand that things aren't always going to be plain sailing, there's going to be a little bit of give and take in terms of sometimes, look, if these boys aren't getting their education right, then I have to say we're well, not training. Um, education comes first and then sometimes with the lessons, if we've got an important game, the school cater for that and then they get that lesson later on in the day. So it's about teamwork with the school and the football. Um, and all of us pulling together for one common goal, really. Yeah, because I know for Caribbean parents um, with aspiring kids that wants to go abroad, it's always a good thing to know that their academics are going to balance off with, with their sport. So as you're saying that, I would like to know, right? And I'm sure everybody wants to know, looking in the future, what are your goals for the football program at Trinity School and how do you plan to expand the opportunities available for student athletes, both for sport and academics? Okay, so how we grow and the opportunities we offer, um, it's relationship. I mean, in England, obviously, the school first and foremost here um, as a school is outstanding. Um, and then I'm, I'm just fortunate that I've been appointed and been able to run a successful football programme, um, which, like I said, is a little bit extraordinary within that school. Um, it is a rare school, there's no doubt about that. Um, and it's been very successful. But first and foremost, the area of developing the student first. Um, like I said, it's a beautiful area, nurturing area. Um, and as a school, that the school's outstanding in terms of what they offer in terms of academics. Um, and then with that, our relationships with other schools and other universities is strong because they know that the students they're going to be getting from Trinity are of a high quality um, and good students and good people. Um, so then the, the relationship we have with universities in the United States as pathways from here um, and obviously in the UK are great. Um, we have a lot of students that go on to, to further their education, mainly at Loughborough and Bath University in the UK, but then also, like I said, in the United States, a huge popular um, option for our students. All right, Ryan. Well, um I was fortunate enough to be up there and visit the, visit the school itself, meet you in person. It, and it, was a, it was a pleasure seeing you then, and it is a pleasure to have hosted you now on this, on this on GN Sports Show. And we would just like to thank you for taking time out. I know the time up there is pretty late. Um, so thanks once again for coming on board and speaking to us about Trinity School in England. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for your time, guys. It's a lovely pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We would like to thank the sponsors of Generation Next, Fruta, Antigua Masonry Products, Kenneth A. Gomez Insurance Agency, Island Photo, and Francis Trading Agency. And welcome back to the GN Sports Show. And right now we are ready to get into one of our favorite parts of each segment of the show, which is with Duran Mead and all we need to know about the physio and health and fitness in the sports world today. Duran, welcome, welcome to the show again, man. Thank you, thank you. Well, you see, today we have the boss of the bosses, Ricky Santos. Yep, I have yep. to show up tonight. You have to show up tonight. <laughs> no, I'm just substituting. I'm just substituting. Hope I do a, as good a job as Jonathan would have done. <laughs> so, Duran, what are we talking about today? I know last episode we talked about concussions, which is a very important thing. What are we talking about this, this time around? So tonight we're talking about back injuries. Mm. Very important. I need everyone to sit and very pay attention to back injuries. So basically, back injury is basically strains or sprains of the back tissues 
or sometimes can involve the spine. Mm. And the spine is something that we we can't play about. Alright, so especially in contacts with other players, especially if we get hit, tackle or we fall bad. Right. We as a physio or even the coaches have to be mindful of if we should put them back on the field. Mm. So what what is what, what are some of the some of the things that could cause the back injury? Like for instance we play on um, uneven surfaces here. We are we are we are big at a, a big disadvantage. Uh, the uneven surfaces can make somebody trip, slide, twist. Can that cause a back injury? Yeah, that's that's basically the number one in the Antigua, even the Caribbean, because as you said, uneven surfaces, and those can really cause damage to your lower back. Mm-hmm. So that's very, it's very, it's very, very crucial. Yeah, I I, I feel a part of that because just talking about Thursday, we there watching a watching a friendly match, and I'm at the sidelines cheering on, and I'm running with the ball, running watching the ball, and the. the the surface is so, there's hole here, a hole here, and you don't realize because it's all grass. And I'm running and, hey, yes, pass the ball, pass the ball. And foot goes down in a hole, and I, um, I off balance, and that could cause a, a back, back injury, that could cause a leg injury, all kind, of, all kind of stuff like that, right? Yeah, and then it can even be worse for you in the future. Because mm. we may just think of it that you just get a little bad trip, and then later down in life, you wonder why your back always hurting. But then it comes just from that little moment in time can cause you a lifetime of back injuries. And what what are some of the corrections or remedies, for the sake of a better word, that you can do if, if you sustain, let's say, a tissue injury on your back? Well, the first thing, you have to make sure your, your core is strong. We overlook our core, not knowing that the core is important to our back, because mm. that comes the stability. It, so long as your core is strong, that helps the back. Right, but if I can interrupt you there just a second. Could you explain to our audience what you mean by the, our core physical strength? Also, like basically, we have to do plenty of abs work. Like sometimes we can even do planks, leg raises, those kind of abs work can strengthen the core and that will help with the back as well. So you're strengthening your core body, the core part of the body, your stomach, your abdominals, and because you're strengthening that, it tightens up and it, it gives a lot of support for your back. Yes. So your back now, even though it go on the strain, the, the core will kind of hold it in and limit the amount of um, problems you could you could experience, right? That's that's basically yes, what it that's is. That's basically it. But what I want to know as well because it's such a a touch and go thing this back the the back injuries and because isn't it to, to, to my mind I'm thinking you can get a little back injury that could come a big back injury because we all think probably it's just a straight bad injury you get and you know you have a back injury. But as you say, you could get something and then in a week two weeks, you get then worse. it starts to get yeah. worse and, and, and get effects. So if you can tell me anything right now as to what we could look at and have it in our mind that it could possibly be something that affects our back, not necessarily a back injury. Just from how you're sitting, just go we're sitting right now, right. can give us back injury. And we don't even know that because sometimes we're so subconscious of how you might want to lean back right. or those kind of things. So you almost always stay in an upright position. Because that as well can give you a back injury plenty of years down the line. Wow. And we don't even know that. You know? So, so, so if, if somebody is, uh, let's say, on a cricket field or a football field or a basketball field, whatever, sporting field, and they twist the back, um, what are some of the symptoms that you can identify right away or close enough right away that this could possibly be a back injury? First, we have to make sure the ear is not numb. Then, when, then we try to make them stand if they have too much severe pains. If you have severe pains, tend to call ambulance. Because mm-hmm. that signify that now that's when the spine come into play. Wow. So that signify you might have a spine problem. So numbness, severe um, pains, those are the two crucial ones. So if they stand and they're in severe pain, before the ambulance arrive, what should you do with them? get like a flat surface something hard and let them just lie right there and don't move but not the floor because most of them think about <laughs> uneven surfaces <laughs> so let's get a ply with them sit on the bench <laughs> <laughs> but no it's it, it's scary you know 
your segment, this segment with you is a very important and very crucial segment for all our viewers. But it's also, it scares you, I'm sure, because it scares me every episode. Because every episode, we realize all the things we take for granted and all the things that could happen to us if we just don't pay attention and, and you know what I mean? Because it's, it's scary. And, and having a back injury and not correcting it in a short space of time, can that cause paralysis? Yeah, you can. And, and how soon would the paralysis normally occur if you don't do the correction right away? Will it, would it be immediate? Would it be in a year, two years time? Well, everybody's body is different. So then it comes down to maybe how severe it is. Or as I said, everybody body is different. So whereas for me, it might come in a week time. For you, it can be five years time. For him, it can be 20 years time. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, so that's why, as it happens, we have to try to seek medical attention one time and then try to get it properly done before it gets there. Can we made us think, hey, just a little back injury, let's move on, keep playing, and then a couple years, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of days, you're wondering, oh, it's, it's too down, I can't get back up, and then that's it, you can't get back up. Yeah. It's sticking in this position. So. And I, I know they have these sprays. That you can spray in somebody to kill the pain. Cortisone sprays. And and sometimes, not necessarily here, but in the professional sports, somebody mm -hmm. gets injured and they spray them with it to relieve the pain and then they continue playing. Now, if you do that with a back injury, that is that is a no-no. Yes, guess. no, no. That can cause even worse pain, even more severe after the game or even a couple of days after. You see, because for the cortisone spray for me, I, b I believe if somebody gets injured, even if it's not a back injury, if it's a foot injury, or, I believe in doing it to relieve the pain, but mm -hmm. take them out of the game. Do not put them back in the game because all you're doing is masking. Yep, masking, masking the injury it and, and then after. I've had, I've, <laughs> I was fortunately, unfortunate to use a cortisone spray before <laughs> for that, with a small injury. And trust me, it is a scary thing. It was scary for me because the pain that I was going through after that spray, I felt like I could do yeah, that. Yes. <laughs> and as you rightfully say, if you feel like, no, 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 coach, I could go back in. I could go back in. But your muscle has not recovered. healed and mm -hmm. recovered. You just mentally feeling because the pain is it gone, does. you're not mm -hmm. feeling it. But that could cause even more damage because now you're going to put more rupture on what you already have right. there. So it's a scary thing, this, this cortisone spray. And I think, I think this segment in particular, because I'm an advocate, if somebody has a back injury, it's a very serious thing that's going to affect you. Paralysis, everything yeah, else in yep, the rest. Yep. How, your, your, how you walk. Yep. And so, so I think that's, this is probably one, in, apart from concussion. Concussion, I think, is another very important Poor thing. That. But mm, the back injury, it affects your work, man. It could, turn, yep. it could turn your swagger into a slugger. <laughs> Lost your swagger, because you know what I mean? No, it, so it's if it if, how, how would it affect, how would normally a back injury affect your smile? Affect your spine. Your spine? Yeah. Well, your spine helps to keep you upright. So. No, but how, how, how would the injury affect it in terms of, you, you spoke about the, the, the cartilage and the, and the tissues. Now, if, if you damage your spine with a back injury, how would, how, would you know, how would you identify that if somebody fell on the back and they damaged your spine? Well, that signifies they can't move. No. You can't move. You, you, you can't feel your legs. Then you can't even sit up. So that's like you're just there. And wondering what's taking place. So you say, can you feel me rubbing my hands and your legs? But could that happen on a sporting field? Yes, it can. Yeah. It depends on how hard how hard they fall on the ground. Right. Yeah. That can just boop, it's it out. Because sometimes it can be like you have a back injury before. Mm. Then you keep playing. Then now you fell again. That makes it even worse. Then now the spine comes into play. So we might think, as, as I said, there's a little back injury. And then we continue playing. And then now you make it even worse. Because now the spine comes into play. That's it. Then now you no more sports for you again. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I, I, I wanna I wanna reiterate this to, to our viewers, right? All the kids, the adults, whoever are in sport or, or any active things. You have to understand that nothing is more important than your health. First of all. And sometimes as, as we know a lot, you get a little fall and you say, no, I wanna keep playing. And that keep playing could make you not be able to be mobile for the rest of your life. That could take you out of the game. Not only sports, but you could end up paraplegic in a wheelchair just because you decide my pride, say, you know what, I still want to play. 
And that is what I think we have to push in people's minds that if you feel something a little off, stop, check it out. But Make I don't, sure it's good. I don't think it's only the players who want to get back in the game. I think the coaches yeah. Yeah. have a responsibility. I'm a firm believer in that. The coaches have a responsibility. If somebody gets injured, I don't care how minor the injury is or may appear to be, take them out and leave them out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that, so that they you can do, they do a proper analysis on their, on their health. Yeah, and on that note, Jiran, we'd like to thank you for coming on the GN Sports Show once again and imparting your knowledge of sports injuries and remedies as a, as a physio. We'd, we'd like to thank everyone for watching our GN Sports Show. Remember to go on our YouTube at GN Sports Show, like and subscribe. It helps build our audience which helps grow the show. Anything you want us to discuss, please feel free to contact us through that page or through our Facebook or Instagram pages. Thank you once again. Cheers.